This con is about to go from totally geek to totally chic. So make some noise for the cast of Can't Buy Me Love, Courtney Gaines and Darcy DeMoss. Make some noise. Hey fans, the 80s were a great time for movies, like Can't Buy Me Love, but you can buy some rad shirts to show your 80s movies love. And they're lessening any pain to your wallet with a coupon code for 30% off. Strike first and strike hard with your next order using coupon code FSBYLOVE and feel that soul glow as you go hauling in the shirts guaranteed to save Ferris. These Top Gun shirts will make you feel like a karate kid running up the steps like Rocky. So head over to 80stees.com. Now, on to the panel. I had to trick them to be here. I told them it was a hard bodies Q&A panel. That's, they totally said, fell said, for this, it. Are you sure this isn't a hard bodies panel, right? It could be either or, right? Yeah, absolutely. Please, if you have hard bodies questions, don't be shy. Yes, um, So I have just been obsessed with Can't Buy Me Love ever since, probably about the same time I've been obsessed with hard bodies, about seventh grade, which is like the perfect age to discover this movie. Um, <laughs> Obviously, you guys were a little more mature than that when the project first came your way. Um, what, if any, do you remember of your first impressions of the project? And was it called Boy Rents Girl when you first? Came yes. On? Boy Rents Girl. Originally, oh, there's a microphone. I'm so sorry. Originally, it was called Boy Rents Girl, and then they got the song Can't Buy Me Love, and the rest is history. So that's it. It's just like we don't think we can get these song rights, and then we did, and like, oh, it's gonna be called Camp on Me Love now. Well, so Touchstone picked up the film, and that and another movie, Stakeout, were their first two movies they put out, which is a division of Disney, and those two movies did super well that summer. But yeah, obviously, once Disney got hell of it, it had bucks, and it cost a lot of money to buy that song, like 250 grand, I think, or something. Oh, wow, I can imagine. Yeah. So, and we also went back and did reshoots after that too, and kind of cleaned up some of the tasteless jokes and things and made it a smart I've heard that there's a, an original cut of the movie that's much raunchier than yes. the version yes. I've, I've become, you know, so in love they with. They kind of took it, you know, from a B movie to a B plus movie. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Well, if that's true, then it's a the minus. greatest B plus, A minus movie that's ever been made. <laughs> uh, no doubt about that. Um, so is there anything you remember from the audition process? Well, I originally auditioned to Cindy Mancini, and I went in after a funeral. It was my grandmother's funeral, oh, in an all-black dress. And the hallway was lined with girls, um, blondes, redheads, brunettes. And I read, and <laughs> I was like, what am I doing here? I should really be mourning, but I really wanted that job. So <laughs> fortunately, um, they brought me back, and I was cast as Patty. Like, I don't know about this goth Cindy Mancini, but now Patty, <laughs> she would be perfect. I'd be crying, you know. <laughs> and Courtney, anything you remember? So, so I had worked for this company, Apollo, Apollo Films was the name of the company that, the, the, that then sold it to, you know, to Disney. I had done another movie for them called Winners Take All. It was a motorcycle movie. And so I came, so I already worked for them once, and I came back, and I read for the Ronald Miller character first, and then they had me come back and read for the Kenneth character. Wow. That's how that happened, yeah. So having worked for them, I think, made a big difference, to be honest. Wow. So yeah. if I get this right, when you first, when the movie went into production, it wasn't Touchstone. They picked it up after most of it had been shot. Correct, so, correct. That's, uh, honestly, in the 80s for me, that happened a lot. Because, uh, you know, things went straight, to, things went to film then. Like, it didn't just go, always go to straight, there's no straight to DVD. It'd go to, and so a lot of films got picked up. Hard Bodies was just a little indie, indie Roger Corman film, and that got picked up by Columbia, and that made a huge difference, a top five distributor like that you know those those when you get if you get it basically if you make a movie it's like whoever picks it up is going to have it's going to make a huge difference whether your film's going to be successful or not if you know because they're going to put the money into it and they have the the, the wherewithal to get into the blockbusters or whatever they got to do right to get it on tv where i discovered both of these films right and right me love. and uh, ironically both were much sweeter and more innocent when i saw them on tv well yeah. True, true. But, yeah, no, but one of the reasons Camp I Me Love does play so much is because what is, you know, it's, it's Disney, which then is, a, is, which is also ABC, which is also... And the Disney Channel. Correct. And I so they pay it. themselves, basically, right? They play it on TV and then they pay themselves for it, if that makes sense. Hey. You know what I'm saying? So it becomes, same thing like, say, something like Sweet Home Alabama. That's the reason that plays all the time. You know, same same company basically. So and all the connections keep coming back together. Right? Yes, what an education um, you're getting in the film industry. Today, and also, folks. Can't Buy Me Love has a really good meaning to it. The oh, undertone yeah. of the film is very sweet, and um, it, people resonate with it. The bullies and 
and all of the, you know, that goes on in it. Oh, definitely. I mean, I love Court McCown, but he is such a dick in that movie. But, like, you love it, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, he was typecast. <laughs> he was typecast. Oh. No, I love Court. He's a very, very good friend. Okay. Don't quote me on that. He knows I love him. He would be laughing, because now he does stand-up comedy. <laughs> Court does stand-up comedy? Yep. Now? Yeah, oh, he's at the comedy God. store all the time. Really? Mm -hmm. oh, I got to get out west and go yeah. see him. That would be amazing. He's, he's all over. Wow. He's not just in just in L.A. He comes out out east. Yeah, it's like AC yeah. and stuff. Oof. He's get... in uh, what South Carolina or North Carolina? I think he's got a place there, so he's like okay. back and forth. Well, next time you guys come back, you're bringing Court with you. Okay, <laughs> I know he would love to. We got to let the fun begin somehow. Um, so I also want to ask if there are any stories, and again, I don't mean to hog the mic, guys, I do want to reiterate that, you know, as soon as I see hands going up there, I'm happy to call them out, but uh, pardon me for fanboying here. Um, do you want to ask if there are any stories of uh, Steve Rash stories, anything, what was his process like working with actors, would you say he was an actor's director, or? No. No. <laughs> Okay. Do you have any good stories? Um, yeah, well, I was already a fan, and that was because of the Buddy Holly story, which I think is a fantastic film. And so I was very excited to work with him in that regard. Um, the best Steve Rash story I can tell is, is the, my famous line, right? You, you shit on my house, right? So that was actually a big monologue that was like, I don't like what they call extemporaneous comp, where people explain things. Like, it was like, I was your friend, I did it for free. I don't like stuff like that, you know? So by that point, he trusted my work. We went in a trailer, and we started, we were gonna like, let's rehearse the scene. He said, what do you think? And I said, I think all of this is bullshit. He said, well, what do you think? I said, that one line, that's what I think. He said, great, let's just do that. Man. And that decision, I think, changed, you know, changed everything. That less is more, you know. I want to tell you, appeal. every time I watch that scene, I'm like, that is the magic take right there. When you, you know, you guys are really, I like, was, I believe I think, the I tension. I we did that on like one or two takes. I think that was take one. And uh, another interesting story about that. So the guy who was, ran Apollo Films was this guy named Jerry Henshaw, which was this rather large man, and large life, larger than life man. And uh, when it got sold a touchtone in a big meeting with the suits, they were like, uh, you know, that, that, that scene is a little too serious, too intense for this nice romantic comedy. We're going we're gonna to want to lose it. And he stood up and he pounded on the table and he said, you're not taking that fucking scene out of my fucking movie. Do you understand? Mm. And he came, I was on the burbs, shooting the burbs, and he came on the set. He said, they tried to get rid of that scene, but I said, you're not taking that fucking scene out of my movie. And I was like, thank God, you know, because that's, that is the meat of the movie, right? I mean, yeah. look, when you talk about the, that's, it's, it's the same stuff. You know, God bless same... Jerry Henshaw. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hey, thank God he stood up for me against the suits at Disney. Yeah. Wow. Um, I do remember something with our director, and um, I actually was like a little mortified to say, in the whole other school, there's only one other titty quite, quite this pretty, and this is it. I said, is it possible for me to please say, in the whole school, this is the best of the breast? And he's like, no, it's not funny. So, so. I think that's pretty gold. That sounds like a yeah. I do. That sounds like a mashup I would make. Like Jesus. Um. He didn't like it. Well, what does he know? No. Um, so I know the film underwent uh, some other changes. Were you guys ever attached when Mark Price was set to play Ronald Miller? I don't even know who that is. Oh my gosh! So Mark Price was famous for playing Skippy on Family Ties. Oh. And I've heard that when it was Boy Rents Girl, he was like attached or something happened and then Patrick Dempsey became available and bye-bye well, Mark. They were really Mark. adamant about having no names. They really didn't want any big stars because they, for some reason. That's how I get all my jobs, if they don't want big stars. <laughs> <laughs> no name. I'll do it. <laughs> No, I did not know that. I've never heard that before. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. I haven't either. And I've met him before and never heard that from him either. But I'm not saying it wasn't possible. I'm I saying, met him I and cannot... I was way too shy to ask. Yeah, he, I was he, like, I don't know. You, he might, you, you know. shy? I, really? You know, I got to have my like, note cheat I'm, cards here. And I've seen Can't Buy Me Love I, like a thousand times. I remember I still... he beat me out on some movie. I can't remember the name of the movie. But uh, where it was like, I think it was kind of a horrorish thing or something. Uh, and I was pissed off because I wanted that job. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie though. Where he gets he gets dark. He's, first he starts out kind of nerdy, oh, and then he gets kind of like a Christine kind of thing, but not Christine. Um, Strange Land Tales or something like no, that. I don't think so. No? I'll know it okay. if I hear it probably. But I just remember I was pissed off. He beat me out. Oh man, that's, I'm I'm pissed <laughs> off for you right now. Bastard. <laughs> Skippy from Family Ties. Um, so one of the Did things. The little blonde guy. 
kid? No, no, he's like kind of nerdy with glasses, oh. right? Skippy, yeah, he, yeah, yeah Skippy. dark hair. Dark hair uh, he was glasses. in love with Justine Bateman, and it, it was like it Urkel would have before. Totally Urkel. A different film, wouldn't it? If yeah. He, if he were cast. I could see him. I mean, I could see why he got a shot at it, but yeah, he wouldn't have made the transformation. Yeah, as well, the obviously. geek you know, would have been good, Patrick but the totally chic. So good. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Patrick is such a great actor. I don't think yep. it gets more eighty chic than Patrick Dempsey. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm telling you, it's you know life goal role model stuff right there. Uh. Um, so another thing I've always loved about this movie, I feel like it's just one of those ensemble casts where like everyone is perfect. I mean, you've got Devin DeVasquez, Tina Gasperi, um, Big John, you know, Rico Suave. I mean, there's yes. just, I could, I could literally just ask about every single person, but in general, do you have any memories of first meeting the ensemble cast? Max or? Perlick, too, you gotta throw him in there. Oh my God. He's had an interesting career. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the first day of shooting, Amanda Peterson, we were filming in the hallway, and she was running around barefoot, and I just, fell in love with her. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, why aren't your feet cold? She's like, I'm from Colorado, this is nothing. And we went to Tucson, you know, for good weather and it snowed when we were there. That's right, yeah. <laughs> wow. So it was really, it was uh, quite an experience, but um, Amanda ended up being my very best friend and I was also, she, when I met the girls, they were both 15, her and Tina. Right, they and were I was, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm working with children because I was 23 at the time and, um, and we, you know bonded with them and uh, Amanda ended up moving to Los Angeles from Colorado and I was her guardian she lived with me oh and uh, yeah uh-huh and wow. she was she got emancipated oh, wow. and, and she lived with my boyfriend Wings Hauser and myself oh my goodness <laughs> this is <laughs> the, the 80s Hollywood sitcom Hills. of my dreams yeah. right now. <laughs> I mean it's crazy and, uh, and then she lived in my apartment at the beach, and um, I mean, we were best, friend, best, best friends for about seven years. Oh and God. then she uh, moved back home. And, you know, we would stay in touch, and I just would call her uh, and say, hey, sweet pea, and she would know it was me because she's like, oh my God, there's only one person in the world that ever calls me that. Aww. So, yeah, it was really completely broke my heart when she passed. Uh, broke a lot just of hearts. It's really just horrible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to try and lighten things up after that, getting a little bit dark. Uh, Sorry. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> I'm, you know, like I said, I'm a big fan of everyone for this movie too, so I'm like right there with you. Um, so who of the cast would you say is most like their character on the screen? I, it sounds like maybe Court <laughs> was your vote. Uh, no, actually, he's a great guy. He's, you know, he's not a bully. Um, Maybe Amanda. I think Amanda. Maybe... Gerard, Gerardo's a little like that when he was young. He was pretty Rico <laughs> Suave. He yeah. was pretty much yeah, Mr. Cool Dude. Oh man. Hitting on the ladies. Okay. Was, uh, we did three movies in a row together, Gerardo and I. We did that that Winners Take All. Then we did Can't Buy Me Love, and then we did Colors. And I got Colors because he knew I grew up in tough neighborhoods in L.A. Because he was a, he, he originally was a pop locker and stuff. That's how he got into any kind of entertainment that led to acting, that led oh, to wow. rapping. But um, he knew that I grew up in the Chuck Chicano neighborhoods, and when he read the script, he'd got the role for Bird that he played, and he's like, dude, there's a white boy, a gangbanger, and you're not going to believe, because nobody knows there's white guys in the gangs, but I do. So it turns out my acting mentor, a guy named Virgil Fry, knew Dennis Hopper well, he helped him make Easy Rider, and so they were having trouble finding that, that guy anyway. So as soon as I got back in town from shooting, I just walked in, took a meeting, and they gave me the gig, you know, I just wore a penalty, and they're like, you know this stuff? I'm like, yeah, I know this stuff. Man, and wow. that was that. But yeah, so we did three movies in a row together, which is pretty crazy. Wow. So then was it mind-blowing when he had this whole new career as Rico Suave later on? Was he, that... had been, he had been talking. He was already recording in, in uh, I think, South America or something. He was doing some... So I, did I think he was going to blow up, though, like that? No, I didn't see that coming. But he was telling me, yeah, I'm doing music down there. I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, good luck with that, man. Like, he's like, you know, like it was before he was talking about like doing Latino, like Spanish, English. It's like, yeah, good luck with that. Did really well. He's a preacher now. Yeah, yeah, he's a preacher. Can you believe that? Whoa. Yeah, change, change this way. I... From player to preacher. <laughs> I never thought I would say this, but I need to get my ass in a church and see one of these sermons, because yeah, that sounds amazing. And Courtney and I, so, yeah, some, somewhere. Uh, Courtney and I, we met on Hard Bodies, which was my first film. Yeah, was it your second film. Your second film? Yeah. And he became best friends with Grant Kramer, and I became best friends with Kathleen Kinmont. And, and we all and, hung out and, together and, and, a yeah, lot. Yeah, and 
the two, the, the two of them dated for a long time. Yeah, Grant and Kathleen Keeney, yeah. um, they, they were um, dating. So we were like the, hang the, yep. the best friends for, that were always kind of yeah. hanging okay, out I, together. I take it back because now that's the 80s sitcom of my <laughs> dreams, there right there. Go. That would you be a pretty good sitcom. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> buddies. Take, take my money now, please. Um, so you mentioned Tucson, of course, and I... I have a special place in my heart for some of these great 80s rom-coms that, for some reason, a large chunk of them were shot in Arizona back then. I don't know if there was tax breaks what, or what it was. What else? Um, just One of the Guys was also shot in Tucson. Um, Bobby, help me out. I feel like you know some of these. Um, putting you on the oh, spot, Bobby. of course. But there was a slew, and it was like around 86 to 88. Like, I don't was, even think they had tax incentives and things back then, so I don't know why. But I always wondered about that, and it's like, again, some of my favorite, you know, gems of the era. And it's not like the John Hughes movies, but it's, right. you know. That high school had just opened. We started shooting, it was closed, it was still summer, and while we were shooting, it opened. It was the, that was the first year the school had opened. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that was, it was brand spanking new. Yeah, okay. I, because I was 23 at the time, I was like, hmm. I got there a, a couple of days early, and I said, can you put me in school for a day or two, like to be a new student? So I could do a little research. So they put me in school, and all, all of a sudden there's this, you know, girl in everyone's class. I was like, everyone just kept like turning around and looking, like, what is she doing in this class? <laughs> okay. I, one of now, the social studies uh, classes, I was debating with the teacher. I was having more fun. It was the only. It was like nobody else was in the classroom. It was just the teacher and myself talking, uh, even though the classroom was full. Uh, and then I remember I had like free period. I was in the library and um, I got asked out on a date. <laughs> and, then, and then later on, you know, what they did was they used all of the kids at school right, as extras. Right, right. And the kids, I knew you didn't belong in this school. I was like, yeah, I'm 23, kid. <laughs> Well, wishful thinking. Um, uh, you know what? Now that's the 80s sitcom that I, you are like a sitcom machine. You've already spit out three shows here that I would tune into every week. So please. Uh, you're just, welcome. Yes, you're welcome, world. Keep, keep them coming, kid. Keep them coming. Yes, you're welcome, ABC, NBC, CBS. You know where to find Darcy. Uh, so, of course, the 80s were a time for two things, both of which were nailed perf to perfection in this movie. Of course, the, the classic high school dance scene. <laughs> Have to ask about any memories of that, or particularly Randy Hall and the incredible uh, soundtrack songs he provided. Uh, anything you remember from that scene would just absolutely make my life. Paula Abdul and I right, were that was the crazy in dance thing. class together for years and years and years and years at Joe Tremaine. We were actually like rivals in dance class. It's like, who's he gonna pick to be up front first? So that was kind of exciting. And, um, and she was a, a Laker cheerleader, and yeah. I was asked to be a Lakers cheerleader. They didn't pay well, and was, I was doing films at the time, so I, I turned it down because it was so many, I, so many rehearsals that they didn't pay. And, you know, they only paid like thirty-five dollars each game. Ooh. It's like well, Ooh, uh, it's like gas costs more yeah. than that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, then Paula came, and she did the choreography. For, for the African ant eater, eater ritual, yes. so it was fun to see her, and um, yeah, I see her a lot because we have mutual friends. Oh, that's so cool! And yet another sitcom I would die to see <laughs> you and Paula Abdul as rivals in the '80s. <laughs> <laughs> These keep getting better and better and better. Like I, you can't leave this room until we have a deal with the network. Okay, please. Um, and any memories for you? I just remember thinking it was going to be a really, like, I thought this is going to be a really funny scene. This is going to be memorable. It's going to be a class. I just, it just, I just knew it was, I just knew that that scene was, even though we had just our little part in it, as it were, that it was, we were playing sort of the straight man, if you were, in the moment. But I was like, this is going to be, this is going to be memorable. That, and it was. It turned out to be really funny. I can you know, personally. A, great, a hell of a reference, you know, the, the 80s reference, the African inter inter oh, inter ritual. Yeah. You know? Oh, my God. Absolutely. You don't know that, you know. And I can personally attest to the impact and memory of this scene because 15 years later, I'm at my junior high school prom. No joke, the entire floor starts doing the dance wow. from Can't Buy Me Love. I'm going to cry. Like, wow. And I'm like, <laughs> half these people might not have even seen this, but we start it and they're into it because this moves rule. Like everything. Oh, it's just perfect. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm dorking out so extremely hard right now guys <laughs> I apologize I should probably remind the audience that this is their panel to ask questions again so as soon as they see hands go up I'm happy to call them out but 
since we're kind of in the dance and soundtrack era, you know, portion of the Q&A here, do you guys have a favorite soundtrack song from the film? Can't Find Me Love. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's yeah. obvious, yeah, so, but yeah. In fact, I was with Devin DeVasquez at her birthday last year, and her husband is a musician, and there were a lot of incredible performers there that uh, you might know if I started rattling off names, but uh, needless to say, they played Can't Buy Me Love for Devin and I, and Devin and I were dancing to the song, and we did the African anteater <laughs> ritual. Oh <my> God. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I love that. He would have paid to be there. So. <laughs> and would you say the same, Courtney, Can't Buy Me Love? Yeah, I mean, I, I, cause it, cause it, it, I mean, it was a great choice, mm -hmm. you know, because it really summed up the and changing the title of it too was a great choice. Oh, it really, definitely. It really summed Boy up Rance the whole, sounds, the whole yeah. enchilada, cheesy. right? Yeah, like yeah. cheap also. Cheesy, like, yeah. You know. Yeah, Boy Rants Girl sounds it a lot. It has a negative it connotation. Like a, it doesn't sound like a studio film. It doesn't no. sound like a you know, family-friendly film. Yeah. That you, it has you know. no finesse, yeah, whereas exactly. that title really does. Exactly. Um, so <laughs> I've also got to ask, you know, you mentioned Port McCown before. You guys were both in the climactic scene of the film. Any memories of shooting uh, the big faux fight scene at the end where Ronald threatens to break, uh, break Court's arm? I cried in that scene. You I was, did, yeah. It was very emotional because, you know, when Patrick starts clapping and, you know, and it, it's just like everybody kind of comes together. So, in, in the film. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a strong scene. I mean, it was a good, it was, it was, uh, you know, it got it got to the core core of the issue. You know, mm -hmm. oh, definitely. Kind of the coolest thing you, know, you talked about, like bully stuff and all that. I've had I've had guys come up to me and say, like, you know, I was I was a football player and I was going into my senior year and I was like looking forward to rousing the freshmen and then I saw that damn movie, and I couldn't do it. And I was like, that's amazing. Like, if a movie could have that kind of impact where it makes people think twice about their behavior, that's pretty powerful. Even if it's a lightweight comedy, as it were, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So, when I was doing a little bit of research for the film, uh, for the panel, I should say, I saw an interesting trivia that I've never been able to spot in the movie, but apparently in that scene, there's two extras fighting in the background. Do you guys have any memory of this? What? I don't know. On IMDb, I don't even... it says, during this scene, when Kenneth puts his hands in his pockets, there's a pink-shirted guy punching out a black-shirted guy in the background. And I'm like, watch, I got the, you know, I got an HD bootleg, and I'm like trying to, you know, because I got to watch the movie in widescreen, come on. <laughs> Get on it, by the way, Touchstone. We need a Waiting freaking... for it, waiting for it, waiting for it. Yeah. I'm waiting for it, like, where's it going to happen? I don't see it. And it's like, I'm thinking it's like a Teen Wolf thing, like the person with their pants unzipped at the end in the bleachers. I'm like, where, how have I been missing this? Where is it? And I don't see it. And, uh, so I just had to ask. Um, I know nothing about this. Yeah, Do you? nope, nope. Mm, well, you never know. You're going you're gonna to be looking for it next time you yep. watch it now. And we just, not too long ago, did um, a Camp By Me Love screening in Los Angeles. Yeah, with, that was, that was with probably Michael, a while. With Michael, well, it was longer, but <laughs> eight years ago. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think with I saw Michael that on Swerdlick. YouTube. Yeah, Michael Swardlick, our writer, put it all together. Right, right, it yeah. A, yeah. It was a reunion screening. It was really, really fun. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I watched it on YouTube about a dozen times or so, because I'm a fan, like I said. And our producer, Mark Berg, went on to produce all of the Saul's. Saw movies. Oh, wow, so he's really... Did he's... he hire us in any of them? No. Nope. So he really... Oh, we're making them in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> like she... Okay. Well, you know... Thanks a lot, Mark. He knew the Saw movies weren't worthy of your talents, is what it is. He didn't want to. He didn't want to ask you guys to like reduce yourselves down to that level. Well you know, said. You know, I, I got to try. Um, so I know the movie was a non-union film. Was there ever any difficulties it, it with was, that? It, it, was, it, it was union. It was union for the actors. The reason people shoot in Ari was shot in Arizona because it was non-union crew. Crew. Oh, the crew yeah. was non-union. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. That, that was. Yeah, the, we're sad. That might be right, why obviously. we can't go that, against our union. That, oh, okay. why, that might be why more people they were shooting movies out there because they could get non-union crews. The oh. Teamsters on a movie in L.A. or New York will kill you. Your whole budget will go to the Teamsters. Scabs. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I'm saying the because they're the first ones there and the last ones to leave, and they get paid really well anyway. So they they just drive the truck up, fall asleep, and then drive, wake up when it's time to leave. <laughs> they, they get paid that whole time. Wow. I'm not, I'm not knocking Teamsters. I'm just saying it's a good gig. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they make more money than us actors. I'll tell you that. <laughs> They always have their feet up with a hat over their eyes. <laughs> yep. Yep. So that's why people do movies in what they call right-to-work states. Oh, 
Okay. Yeah. So that's what that was all about, the non-union All aspect. the movie trivia you guys are learning. I'll yeah, be taking we're notes. Covering yeah. all the secrets You'll here. You'll be ready to produce something love. after this. So one I, of course, have to ask also. I'm just dying to know if there is any more of this movie out there that exists. Were there any maybe deleted scenes, anything you guys remember shooting that was cut from the film? My scene in the car was re reshot. With, in the car with Patrick. Right, yeah, the, yeah, the tic tac tile. Yeah, mobile. I had um, glitter all over me, and they, they brought me back. They said, it looks like you're sweating. We need to reshoot the scene. The glitter was too, <laughs> wow. All the things people reshoot scenes for, mm -hmm. you know, too glittery. Wow, I would not have expected that. Um, so were there, and again, I'm sorry if I'm hogging the mic, guys. I want to reiterate again, feel free to raise hands at any time, but I'm very enthused. Hey, there's one. There's all right. one. In the front row, Mr. Bobby. In one scene, I'm painting on my face. I just yeah, thought it would be kind of cute. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just I thought she wanted to be a beautician, so um, mm. you know, she was like she was always playing with makeup, playing with different things. And I had the ribbon, and then I had the stars. We tried clouds, but they didn't really show up because they were white. Um, and, but you know, I wanted rhinestones, but then they would blind the camera, so the rhinestones didn't really work. But yeah, that was like my character choice. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the movie, um, there was like uh, Kenneth with Tudor and Darcy. Uh, do you think that could have been like a funny movie? Oh, could it, good question. Sequel. <laughs> she realizes I'm gonna be an accountant and make a lot of money. <laughs> But you made me think of a makeup thing, which I haven't thought of for a long time. It's the only time it's ever happened. Do you remember the makeup artist's name? I don't remember her name. I remember I, her husband was an accountant. I ended up, he was my accountant for a lot of years, for a number of years, like 10 years. He was like accountant to the stars. And I was always like, I don't make that much money, but I'll do it. But she would actually put makeup on me to get rid of my freckles and then paint freckles on my face. Great makeup. I swear to God, I'd be like, why are we doing this? But that's the only time that's ever happened. I think she enjoyed it. She was like, <laughs> I don't know. It's the only time it ever, ever happened. Huh? I, I don't know. She, or, yeah, she was into it. Yeah, so my freckles were painted on. Was, or she had a Courtney crush, and her oh, husband was a be. boring accountant, could, could, and she could, just wanted could, to spend could, some time be, with be, you. Could be. Could be. Also, be. Um, we had a wardrobe person that was like bought this really horrific purple fabric from my dress for the dance and she showed me the the dress she was going to make from the pattern and i literally went to the producer mark burr crying going i, I don't want to wear that it really it looks terrible before she makes it and so he said he fired her they fi ended up firing her for uh, not just before me but for a lot of her choices and uh, we got a new wardrobe person and she took me shopping and I got to pick out that outfit that I wore to the dance, which I still have. Oh, yes. I always love hearing that people keep, kept some mementos or some props or anything like that. Um, so you mentioned the word sequel a little bit before. I have to ask, was there ever any talk of a Can't Buy Me Love 2? Never. What is wrong with this Never. world? Well, Mark Berg redid it. His right. wife. Um, with Nick Cannon called Money Don't Cost a Thing. Love Don't Cost a Thing. And it was an African-American version of Can't Buy Me Love because Mark Berg had bought the rights of the script from Michael Swardlick and let her do her rewrites. Well, I'm still ready and I'm still waiting for Can't Buy Me Love 2. <laughs> you know, maybe a streaming series. Come on, it could be the next Cobra Kai. You never know. We'll have our walkers. <laughs> Walk your walker races. <laughs> Get out of here with that talk. You guys haven't changed a bit. Um, so was there any uh, premiere opening weekend stories? Anything memorable there? Oh, we had a great premiere. Do you remember? Where was it? Oh, my God. Well, there was a big screening, and then we went to, um, oh, God, it's, it's that big, beautiful hotel on Doheny. The Four Seasons. Oh, that's by right. The pool. I remember that. Where, and, was the, where was the screening? I don't remember. I, I don't remember that either, but I remember <laughs> the Four Seasons. Yeah, the Four Seasons, they, they had a huge, like, yeah. big party. Right. And, that was oh, nice. the, th the theater was on Fairfax. 
I was on that on La Brea or Fairfax. Okay. And uh, yeah, I don't they had photographer, for photographers outside screaming my name when I got out of the car. <laughs> I don't remember the screening. Like, That's oh kind of scary. Oh my god! I've arrived. I'm an actor. Yeah, yeah, so, wow. Oh my god, I love it. <laughs> but yeah, I remember going to the Four Seasons, like up on the roof, right? It was by the pool. By the pool, on, like the yeah, third yeah, floor. Yeah. Yeah. And they had big "Can't Buy Me Love" towels, which now I use for as a rag because it's so old. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I even grabbed one of those. I don't remember all that stuff, man. I had that stuff. I, I they had a lot of stuff. they had pink and white carnation like sodas. They look they look like a you know, like a soda fountain drink, you know, like a malt or whatever you would drink with beautiful straws of glitter all over them, on garnishing every table. Wow. That's the A-list Disney treatment right there. Yeah. That's outstanding. Yeah, I remember the towel now. I remember that. I don't know what I ever did with it, but I remember that. <laughs> I'm so used to doing, like, you know, lower budget. Me, so used to doing panels on lower budget horror movies. People are like, there was no premiere. Like, <laughs> right. we drove around L.A. and saw if there were lines. There weren't, you know. Well, I went with Amy Dolan's. Because uh, we had the same manager, Bob Robert Marcucci. We got a limousine, uh, and, so um, like and so, paparazzi. Uh, yeah, that so name that was sounds really familiar fun. too. Robert, Robert Marcucci. Marcucci. Yeah. Well, he was the original Idol Maker. Oh. So if you remember the movie, The Idol Maker, that movie it was, was a good movie. Him. You ever see that movie, Idol Maker? I don't think I have. That's a good movie. And he um, he he discovered Fabian. So oh, yes. yeah, right. Amy Dolan's and I had the same manager, and Peter Dobson was with him, and. Sasha Jensen, and I don't know. Oh, oh there's a whole group of us, Wolf Larson. So many of my favorite 80s, uh, mm -hmm. 80s heroes right there. That's outstanding. Um, so I'm a huge fan of, obviously, Can't Buy Me Love. Um, I love the way some of these movies are coming back through fan documentaries and stuff like that. And obviously, it seems like there's a, you know, a thousand stories that went into the making of this movie. Is that something you guys would ever participate in, like a fan documentary? Hell yeah. Yeah? Yeah, of course. Sure. All right. Well, I'm trying to speak it into existence, so world, get at it. Um, maybe, maybe you and I should work on something like that together. We could talk that about would it. be fun. Where yeah, are they That's now? a lot of docies. are a lot of work, though, man. Whew. And no money. Yeah, and no money. Exactly. <laughs> well, you could take mine, whatever, like both dollars of it, and that's your start right there, okay? You never know. Thank Bucking you. a dream. You got, tw you got two of them. Um, so again, I want to reiterate again, audience, I know everyone gets Last a chance, shy. he's got a question. I want to give you time again before we run out. Okay, Bobby. that I'm aware of. Yeah, it didn't seem like, like, I think she was right. It was pretty much everybody in there was, you know, it was one of those rooms you walk in and like, you're like, oh shit, I recognize everybody in this room. I better kick ass. You know, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't one of those rooms, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, since we're just about out of time, just get a, one or two more in before I let you guys get back to your tables. Um, I, sometimes I struggle to put into words, you know, when a movie like Can't Buy Me Love, like, I love it. Why is it different than the other 80s movies? Like, I don't know, it just is. It's great. It's got heart. It's got all these things. But what, to you, sets the film apart from other, you know, 80s comedies? Um, I, think, I think, first off, like you said, the casting was, was, was good, but I think the people that were involved in the, the actors, even though you know, they may have been right for the part, what I mean is that people were pretty dedicated to what they were doing. Like, like you know, she talked about the girls hung out with all the guys, right, obviously. And everybody was, like, pretty deep in it. I mean, Patrick was, like, deep in what he was doing. He was, like, doing, like, a whole kind of, like, method vision board thing with Rocky, his coach. He then ended up being his wife later. But it was a whole... It was 52. Right. right. Yeah, but, 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 but I'm saying, Which, like, it, he really did this whole... Like, he was, like people thought he was kind of, like, standoffish because he'd be playing headphones to get himself. It's, like, it's kind of method -y kind of stuff, right? And... I too was a method, you know, method actor, not quite doing what he was doing, but like we talked about all that stuff, like how we work and all the guys were into like that kind of stuff. And I think that that's what you, I think it was a pretty good cast of actors. I think that, that number one, you know, I think helped a lot, you know, good casting. Yeah, and then number yeah. two, it's just that it, the message had, it, for, for a movie that was it's supposed to be, like you said, a romantic comedy, I think it, it had something a little deeper underneath that, you know, about just, I think they caught the, the culture of cliques in school and all that that we all, we all Michael know. Michael Swordlick, Yeah, the I think they caught the cliques, you oh, know, yeah. in, a, in a really good way, you know. Yeah. You know, we, I think we all kind of felt that there was a lot of love on set, a lot of camaraderie. Everybody, like, 
there was only one time that I remember somebody like snapping and it was our director for one moment. It was but when you were filming that scene with Court. Because all that's like the only little like thing that was like a, the, I don't know, I can't ex describe it, so I'm going to just let it go. But um, yeah, I just feel like that we, we felt all the love and, and I think it, show, it shines through in the film. Yeah. Well, fans are still feeling the love however many years later. I'm feeling the love getting here to talk, getting to talk with you guys here. I want you guys, please stop by their tables, get some autographs, get some pictures. I know they have more stories and hey, some more Friday love. Hey, Friday the 13th. I like it. Yes, absolutely. So, and yes, put your hands together, make some noise for Courtney Gaines and Darcy DeMoss. Thanks for letting us talk about ourselves. <laughs> Hey fans, just a reminder that this panel was sponsored by those movie lovers over at 80stees.com and you'll save 30% off your next order with the coupon code FSBYLOVE. Celebrate your own movie love over at 80stees.com today. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like, like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.